Hello, in this video, I'm going to talk about focusing attention. Um, so when we talk about attentional focus, what we mean is the directing of attention to specific characteristics in a performance environment or to action preparation activities. Um, so we are using our attentional resources and deciding where we're going to direct those um, when it comes to specific aspects of the movement or the performance or the environment that we're performing in. Uh, so when it comes to attentional focus, we can describe it in terms of width and direction. Uh, so the width of focus, uh, we can have attention that is broad or narrow in focus. So we can be zeroing in on something very small and specific, or it could be more broad and where we're taking in more of our environmental cues. Uh, direction of focus refers to whether the focus is external or internal. An external focus is where we're looking at our external environment and looking for cues in the environment. An internal focus is where we're focusing internally on thoughts, plans, problem solving activities, maybe we're thinking about the skill that we're about to use and so on. Uh, tension switching is where we are shifting in the width and or width and or direction of our focus um, or on the object of our attention. And this can be good or bad, depending on the situation. Uh, so attention switching is necessary in a situation like uh, maybe you're playing basketball and you have the ball, you have to decide, are you going to dribble and move across the court? Are you gonna shoot? Are you gonna pass to a teammate? Um, and so you have a lot of decisions to make and you need to be taking in your environment to make that decision. Um, so you need to be switching your focus from you know, different uh, uh, teammates to different competitors and making that decision on what is gonna be the best play there. So in that case, it's advantageous to switch your attention. Um, but it's disadvantageous if we are switching between appropriate and inappropriate sources of information. Uh, so imagine you're playing a piano piece and you're doing it by reading music. Uh, the appropriate source of information in that case is the music that you're reading. So you want to maintain your attentional focus on reading the music. But if every so often you are shifting your focus to look down at your hands and the keys, or you're getting distracted by something else in the environment, and that's drawing your focus away from reading the music, which is the only appropriate source of information at that time. Uh, so in that case, it's disadvantageous. You're more likely to lose your place in the music or get distracted or um, make other errors. Um, so then there is the long standing question of, is it preferable to focus attention on your own movements? So the internal focus on uh, the actual skill that you're executing, or should we be focusing on the effects of the, mu the movement? So an external focus. Um, so like if I'm reaching for my coffee cup on the table, am I focusing on the movements I'm making to reach for the cup? Or am I focusing on the effects of the movement, which is the actual cup itself and being able to successfully lift it and drink from it? Uh, so that's been a long-standing question uh, that has been answered again and again in the literature. Um, and so what is found is that when performers direct their attentional focus to the effects of the movement, they, per they perform at a higher skill level. So with more accuracy, um, better coordination, more success in the movement uh, compared to when you're actually thinking about the movement itself, when you're paying attention to how the movement is taking place. Uh, so there are two related hypotheses here. Uh, the action effect hypothesis says basically that actions are best planned and controlled by their intended effects. Um, so when we are thinking about the effects of the movement and what the goal is essentially, uh, that the action is planned and executed with more success. Uh, the constrained action hypothesis attempts to answer why that is. Um, so an internal focus constrains the motor system because the performer consciously attempts to control it, which disrupts the automatic motor control processes that should control the skill. Uh, so the idea is that um, when we are executing a skill that we've done before, so maybe we have some experience or practice and maybe we're even highly skilled at it, 
um, that the motor control system should be in charge of that, that the nervous system should be in charge of controlling that movement. And that when we have an internal focus, so we're paying too much attention to how we are executing that movement, we sort of let our cognition get in the way of the automat automaticity of that movement. Um, so it's sort of like, instead of letting the nervous system control the movement, we are trying to control the nervous system to control the movement. And that uh, inappropriately constrains how the motor system is able to execute the movement because we're limited to what we're thinking about instead of being limited to what the nervous system is capable of and how uh, what is the most efficient, effective way of controlling that movement. Uh, so when it comes to focusing attention during learning, there's some debate about where it is best to, to maintain our focus. Uh, so the appropriate focus of attention might be determined by skill level, but again, that is debated. Um, so skill focused attention is that internal focus, like we were just talking about, uh, where we are focusing on the actual execution of the skill. So we're paying attention to what we're doing, how we're moving, and paying attention to any certain aspect of executing the skill. Now, that might be appropriate in early learning, but again, that is debated. But imagine you've never played tennis before, and now you have an instructor, and they're showing you how to do a tennis serve. So when you're first learning how to do a tennis serve, you might be thinking, okay, I got to keep my elbow up and, you know, throw the ball this high. And you might have to really consciously think about every little aspect of the skill that you're learning while you're learning it. Um, so in that scenario, skill-focused attention might be most appropriate, but again, that's not conclusive. We don't really know for sure. Environmental-focused attention means that we're focusing our attention away from the actual execution of the skill, and we're looking more at environmental cues. So maybe not necessarily relevant to the actual skill, but we're looking at maybe cues about when to start this, the skill or how to move, what choice we're going to make in terms of which uh, action we're going to take. Um, so we're looking more broadly and we have an external focus on what's going on around us instead of internally on what we're actually doing. Uh, so environmental focused attention is appropriate for more skilled performers um, because more skilled performers have more experience and practice. And so they've proceduralized most of the aspects of the skill execution. Uh, so if we just get out of our own way, then we can let the nervous system take over and complete that skill more automatically while we are paying attention to other environmental cues that will also be important in whatever situation we're in. Uh, De-automization of skills hypothesis says that highly skilled individuals may suffer from skill-focused attention because they're overriding their automatic control processes. Um, so when somebody is skilled and they have practice and they are able to complete an action pretty automatically because of all the repetition, um, if they start paying too much attention to the action itself and how they're completing it, uh, that can result in what we call choking under pressure. Um, so when we start paying too much attention to, you know, how many steps are we taking or how are we swinging the bat, you know, we start paying attention to those things instead of paying attention to the ball and the contact with the ball. If you're thinking too much about the swing or the step into it or some other aspect of the skill, that's where we start to fail. So that's where we choke under pressure, so to speak. Automaticity is referring to um, how we automatically are able to complete an action after we've had enough uh, experience and practice with that action. Um, so we can learn automaticity of pretty much an any skill, most skills, maybe there are some that never become automatic, but for the most part, most motor skills can become automatic if we practice them enough. Um, so we should view automaticity more on like a spectrum, like a sliding scale. It's not either automatic or not. It's, you know, we have varying degrees of automaticity depending on the skill and how much practice and skill we have with that action. Uh, visual selective attention 
Um, so selective attention in general doesn't have to be visual, but it's the detection and selection of performance related information in the performance environment. So that can be auditory, like hearing the go signal when you're starting a race, or um, it, could be, it could be any type of um, sensory input uh, for selective attention. Visual selective attention is that, but specifically visual. Uh, so it's the role of vision and motor skill performance in directing visual attention to environmental information that influences the preparation and or performance of an action. Um, so visual selective attention, we're paying attention to certain things that are taking place in the environment. So like maybe um, in baseball, the ball coming towards you, you're selectively visually paying attention to the ball. Um, maybe you're observing the amount of rotation of the ball. So, and you may not even realize that you may not realize that as you're seeing the ball come towards you, that you're paying attention to the amount of rotation, but a highly skilled performer is at least subconsciously paying attention to that. Um, because that's going to factor into how exactly they hit that ball to successfully, uh, you know, hit it out of the park or <laughs> um, hit it wherever they're aiming for, I guess. Um, visual search is the process of directing visual attention to locate relevant environmental cues. Um, so we are visually searching the environment and looking for environmental cues, like seeing, um, seeing somebody stealing a base. <laughs> or uh, seeing the ball coming towards you or uh, seeing an opponent coming towards you is gonna tackle you or whatever, you know, it depends obviously on the sport or on the skill, but we're, we're in the process of sort of scanning the environment to find the thing that we should be paying selective attention to. Um, so eye movements are used in a lot of research where they're trying to track what you're paying attention to. Um, but there are some flaws here. It's not a bad method, and we can largely accept the results in those types of studies, but it is possible to give attention to a feature in the environment without moving the eyes to focus on that feature. And in those cases, those that attention would be lost in that type of study because you're tracking uh, your central vision. So they're tracking where the eyes are looking and assuming that wherever your eyes are looking, um, in your central vision that that's what you're paying attention to. Um, so it is true that wherever you're looking with your central vision, you are paying attention, but you can also be paying attention to things in your peripheral vision. Um, and so that type of study loses that, that other thing that you might be paying attention to. So like maybe we're playing a sport and I, in my central vision, I'm looking at my teammate and getting ready to pass the ball but I'm still paying attention in my peripheral vision to my opponent who's getting closer or an opponent who's gonna intercept the ball. Um, so you're still paying attention to other things that are not necessarily in your central vision. Uh, so studies that use eye movement recordings typically underestimate what the person is paying attention to visually because you're not tracking that peripheral vision attention. Uh, feature integration theory. Uh, is during visual search, we automatically group stimuli together according to their unique features like color or shape. Okay, so when we are visually scanning the environment, we tend based on color and shape to and other uh, characteristics depending on the situation, but we tend to make sort of maps for ourselves of things that fit together. Um, and it depends on what is relevant in that situation, but maybe we're playing basketball and I can at a quick glance, see where my teammates are based on the color and design of our uh, uniforms compared to the, the color and design of our opponents. Um, so you can do a quick visual search and get kind of a basic map of what you're looking at and where your different teammates are and where the opponents are. Um, and then we use those features that we've identified and made this sort of mental map of to then further search and look for specific cues. So maybe you're looking for cues from your own teammates, like that they're open or that you can throw the ball to them. Um, or maybe you're looking for cues from your opponents, like that they're getting ready to intercept the ball or that they're getting ready to kind of move in one direction or another. So you're going to look for specific cues that you can sort of narrow down based on these, these kind of broad maps 
of color or shape or other characteristics. Um, so visual search picks up critical cues that influence three parts of the action control process. That's action selection. So like um, your, the cues that you're picking up in the environment might lead you to pass the ball or shoot the ball or pass to a different teammate. Um, so those are different actions that you're selecting from. Uh, it also um, helps you constrain the selected action. So depending on what you need to do in that environment. So let's say you choose to pass to your teammate, you're playing basketball, you're going to pass the ball to your teammate. Um, so you need to constrain that action based on that specific situation. So you might choose different types of passes. Um, you might have to kind of move differently or because you might be throwing around an opponent. So like you might have to move and, and complete that pass in a different way, depending on the constraints of that environmental context in that specific situation. Um, and then also visual, visual search helps you with the timing of the action initiation. Um, so it helps you time when exactly should you be passing the ball? Is your teammate ready to receive it? Um, is there an opponent uh, trying to steal the ball? Um, so you'll time that action according to visual cues. Um, so then the next natural question is how do we train visual search? Because visual search is important in successful completion of lots of different types of actions. Um, so we uh, improve our visual search strategies uh, naturally. So that happens just normally with training and experience and practice. Um, so we naturally improve in that uh, ability, but it's very uh, activity specific. So it's very sport specific, very skill specific. It's not something that a general training strategy is going to be successful with. Um, because if we are trying to train someone to visually search for the right cues, then that has to be specific to a situation so that we can tell the novice uh, what they should be looking for, what should you be paying attention to, and so then give them a chance to practice looking for those specific cues. And so we can train someone to visually search their environment and improve at that faster than they naturally would without specifically targeting that. Um, but a generalized approach just is not effective because then you can't tell them what they specifically should be looking for. Um, so they don't really improve at any specific thing because they're not looking for anything specific. An example of this is I remember when I was learning to drive, a piece of advice that just stuck with me all these years was that when you're driving and you're driving past parked cars, pay attention to if their front tire is turned toward the road, it could indicate that there's somebody in that car getting ready to pull out into the road. So be aware when you see tires on parked cars that are aimed toward the road, be ready that somebody might try to pull out in front of you. And so you should expect that. And that stuck with me. That's an example of a visual search strategy where I was a novice, I was just learning how to drive and I was given instructions about a specific cue in the environment that I should look for um, that could indicate a certain event that would follow. Um, and so, that really stuck with me for a long time and maybe made me vet better at visually searching and being prepared while I was driving. All right. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next video.